I sold an article uh, to uh, Playboy, and they gave me $2,000, which was a lot in those days. And I rented a house in Saint-Tropez and spent the summer in Saint-Tropez. So you didn't particularly have a habit of going there and go to the anti jazz festival? Oh, no, no, no. It was the first time. I, was, I, I had been in France, but, you know... I, I wanted to come back, and there was my chance, so I spent two months uh -huh. there. And they happened to be there in 67. It was also the summer of Sgt. Pepper, and, and mm -hmm. John Coltrane died, and it was like full of meaning that summer. And uh, they were playing on the, they, they were in a, in a club, they had a contract or a gig with a club that went bankrupt, so they were stranded. And they, they I, I don't know how they got this, but they played on the place in front, of, in front of City Hall, in front of Town Hall, one afternoon with wires and, you know, I mean, electric, which was weird then. Well, I mean, cables everywhere, and uh, I just walked by. I couldn't believe it. That wasn't the first time you saw them. First time I ever heard of them. Oh yeah. So yeah. you you didn't go to the beer festival, uh, no, which they that? were playing. Well, the first thing they were playing, which went bankrupt. Where was that? Uh, that was in uh, Cogolin or near Saint Tropez, anyway. Oh, maybe. Before, before they played. The maybe. Well I, well, I got there at that time, and the first time I, you know, that was what I heard. Then some friends of mine were putting on this play of Picasso in a tent outside of town, but the desire caught by the tail. Who and were you friends with? Jean-Jacques Lebel? Yeah, Lebel and Alan Zion. How did you first get to know them? Oh, Alan Zion was, he had a house, he had a kind of salon in Paris, on Rue de la Tombe Soir. He was a filmmaker. Right? Yeah, but he was, he was direct, he directed that. And there was a guy named uh, Victor Herbert, who made a lot of money selling stocks for uh, a guy who ended up in a Swiss jail, um, a Bernie Cornfield. And so he was financing this thing, and he was like, a, he had the living theater, was living at his house all the time, and stuff like that. Good guy, actually. Good, a bit naive, but very nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was there anyway. All this was happening at the same time. And then I heard, I heard the band, and uh, I mean, I'd never heard that before. You know, playing in seven and nine with a rock, you know, with the, I mean, frankly, Robert is, is probably the best rock drummer I ever heard. You know. Uh, uh, maybe, I, I mean, I may be naive, I'm not a rock expert, but boy, he, I mean, he sure could... Uh, I know one thing, he was the first one to play without a shirt. Everybody yeah. said, he's playing without a shirt! That was big deal then. Well, apparently they even did a gig in the nude, completely, well, uh, no, uh, during that trip. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, not surprised. Near a swimming pool. But I got to know Robert, because he, he, like, he had a really good jazz culture, and we started talking, and you know, he grew up with, you know... with Robert Gray. Yeah, and all that. And uh, so I had, a, I, had, I had bought an old uh, Duchevo, and uh, Dave Brubeck was playing at, uh, I guess, Antibes. And uh, I, I, I knew Paul Desmond, so I was going down there to see and maybe an interview him, you know. So it was a, what, a two-hour drive in that old car, just a day trip, night trip. And uh, so I asked Robert if he wanted to come with me. Oh, man, he wanted to meet Paul Desmond. He wanted to meet so badly you know he was so happy he talked about Paul Desmond's record so we were so we drove down but he did he, he wore no shirt and no shoes it was hot it was August during the daytime yeah well we were gonna have dinner but so we drove in the late afternoon yeah. and maybe he carried a shirt but he wasn't wearing one he may have had it in the back seat and uh, he was so impressed I mean and we sat at a restaurant the three of us maybe not David and that might have been some girl I don't know they, we had dinner and and Robert was perfect but I mean really ad adoring he was talking about Paul Desmond. You were basically on a holiday there. No, 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 no. I was not. I, I, I was you, writing you a weekly column. The, the no, no. I, I wasn't. I don't. I wasn't going to do anything. I was there. I was writing a weekly column, and that was obviously a, a, a good subject. And I went down the coast to get Paul Desmond because he was another one, you know. And uh, I, I was just working, and I, I saw them, and I, got, I really liked them, and I got friendly with Robert. He's a great guy. In that article, you were talking about Paul Desmond's attitude towards Robert and saying that he was a bit wary of Robert at first because of his long hair. His long hair and his no shoes, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. And, it, and he was hippie. also shirtless during the... No, I think he must have put it on. Yeah. I remember him sitting in the car shirtless. Yeah. I remember him very well in that old douche of old, but I mean, he must have had a t-shirt or something. Because it was, it, it was cool, we were there in the evening. Did you get to see the uh, Desire, called by Hotel, uh, show of several times? Yeah, a couple of times. What do you remember of it? Uh, not all that much, it was like, a, it was like an avant-garde circus. Uh, there were fireworks and, and the band was on stage and uh, it was quite separate from the play itself the band playing they were playing no they played on stage during the, yeah. the actual that's the way I remember it but hey that's a long time ago uh -huh. there was a, a woman from uh, from the Lido I think named uh -huh. uh, do you know what I'm talking about Rita Lenoir Rita Lenoir right right you know that yeah she was the star she was weird and there was a guy with a shaved head a French guy who was the, the male star 
who was also known like her, and whose name I can't think of now. But the Living Theater was around there. I mean, they, they used to come on sometimes. They were on stage sometimes. I forget the names now, but that was a big deal back then, you know. So it, it was like, uh, Central Bay was like, a, a, for, some, for some reason, a center of art and music, you know. <laughs> That's exaggerating, not really. But there was a lot going on there, a lot of people passing through. That particular thing, was it marginal or was it like the attraction of, of the town? No, no, it was out of town. Somebody, they couldn't, they were going to do it in the Papagayo and then the mayor wouldn't let them or, or the owner wouldn't let them. That's a cafe, I think that's the name of the cafe, the Papagayo. And so they, somebody leased them some land outside of town and they put up a circus tent. A festival of free theater. Was it free? I think people paid to get in. Well, it was theater, free in another sense. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a living theater and all that. Did you also make friends with the other guys from Soft Machine? Or well, I did. Yeah, I mean, we were friends, but Robert and I became good friends, you know. Yeah. But because I mean, of his personality as well as his taste for jazz. I don't know. Just the way it, you know how do you make friends? Yeah. Just the way it worked out. Did you think anything particular of Mike Rutledge from a jazz point of view? Yeah, I thought he was a real good, a very, very good player, mm -hmm. really good musician. Uh, excellent, excellent. I was just floored by him. Mostly it was Robert, though. I had never heard drums played like that. As a drummer, more than a vocalist? Was he even singing then? Yeah, he must have been, well, of course he was. Not too much about But no, as a vocalist, no. Doing this no, 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 I don't even remember him. I remember him singing, yeah. but uh, he was a drummer. Man. He was the only rock drummer I could be, I've ever heard play in 13 and make it sound totally natural, you yeah. know? You did see Soft Machine uh, the following year after, after the Central Bay thing on, on the U.S. tour, right? You saw the Museum of Modern Art. Thing? No, I, didn't, I don't know if I saw. Did I see them? I was. They arrived. Oh, they opened for Jimi Hendrix, and they arrived on top of the Pan Am building, which still then had a helipad. You know the Pan Am building, which was. It's called something else now. It's the one right above Grand Central Station. It's like a cigar, and now it's, it's got some insurance company name on it. Anyway, it's the Pan Am building, and they had a heliport. And so all the jazz press was up there in the lounge, and, you know, every all the hippies, and blah, 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 blah. And they come off, the helicopter lands, and they come off. And what a sight that was. You know, Hendrix, first of all, Hendrix all by himself, but with Mitch Miller, I mean, all these people. And, and then the soft machine with their, you know, big furry coats and long hair and, and the shade. So, Jesus Christ, this is a fucking invasion. <laughs> Nobody really knew anything about all that. That was, I guess, 68 then, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was amazing. I didn't. I don't know if I ever heard them. If I did, it didn't impress me. But uh, I might have. I heard Hendrix, but that nobody opened for Hendrix. I mean, I heard him at Hunter, which was a small hall. No, he was by himself. I, did, I don't know if I heard them on that trip.